getting anything done. So, so I'm going to tell a little story here. Um, I'll call him Business Guy Joe. Business Guy Joe and I had worked together at that point for about seven years. And I knew Business Guy Joe had some, you know, I guess ticks that would tell me when he was getting a little frustrated with me or frustrated with the conversation. Um, he would do a few things. When he was not happy, you know, sitting, he would, he would always lean forward when he was first having the conversation. But when he was not happy, he would start leaning backwards in the seat. And he would kind of distance himself from the person that he was talking to. And then if it escalated, he would you know, do one of these. And he would lean even further back. And then this is, this is the, the best one. It was the blackberry on the table. When he was really mad, he would do one of these. And he would just pick it up, and he would look at it. And I don't think he actually ever looked at anything on there. He was just almost like signaling that he was done with the conversation. So he was like, forget it, I'm done. And so I had learned to pick these ticks up and know when to aggressively ask him questions or know when to pull back from the conversation. So when we injected the engineers into conversations with him, basically what happened is they picked up on none of those ticks. And actually, it escalated into, like almost immediately, into one of the greatest arguments of all time in my career, which was the guy saying, you know, I'm the business person, this is my product, and I want this thing on the screen. And I don't care about, it was, it was, we were talking about a text box on the screen, OK, just to be clear. So the engineers were like, what do you want in that text box? Is there information somewhere on a different screen that you can use? Um, or it, should it be on this box? Because maybe you don't need to, maybe it needs to be on this screen versus this screen. How many characters are going to be in that text box? Uh, should, it be, should it be a number or do you actually want to type? What are your reporting plans on this text box? You know, you guys probably have other questions pending in your head about what am I going to do with this text box? So business guy was like, I don't care. Just don't care. Just give me a text box so I can type. I don't care what you're going to you know, do with it after the fact. Just put it on the damn screen. And so when he was like, just do what I said, you can imagine the reaction on the other side of the table, which was, how dare you tell me what to do with my product? This is my baby. This is not your job to tell me how to do it. You're supposed to tell me what problem you have, and I'm going to come up with a solution. That's agile. And I was like, whoa. And so. These, these gaps in communication caused tremendous friction as the two years went on, as you can see why I had a hellish period of my career. And instead of me viewing this as a way for me to think about my career differently, like I actually viewed Agile as very threatening because I thought it was going to essentially eliminate my job eventually. Like I thought engineers would take over the world and I would need to learn how to code and, oh god, what am I going to do? Um, so generally I thought, there's no way that long-term project managers are going to be needed or business analysts are going to be needed in the role of software. So I was very threatened by this. But what I failed to realize was instead of viewing my changing role as a threat, what I could have done is view it as an opportunity to teach the other people around me what I knew about Business Guy Joe and what I knew about his body language and, and how to effectively communicate in a way that other people could actually hear what you were saying. So the four soft skills, and in case you weren't wondering, I am referring to soft skills and soft skills, if you would, um, that I think you all need to be excellent at in order to self-profess yourselves as quote unquote DevOps engineers are communication, collaboration, the ability to resolve conflict, and compromise. So we're going to talk about these in terms of actual examples, so you guys can have a reference. And we'll see what you guys think. So, so number one, communication. So this is open source land. And communication isn't something that we have often time to actually be face to face with people. But there's a lot of different forms of communication. There's email, IRC. Um, if you're old school, there's you know, forums, if you so desire. Uh, you know, Whatever you want to do, there's other other types of communication instead of face-to-face. -face. The only thing that you need to know is that you need to be able to express your ideas calmly and concisely. And you need to be able to read people because there is a heck of a lot of nuance in the way that people are perceiving. So like I know that if I look across the room, I can see who is actively paying attention and who might be coding. 
so you guys will know. Also, too, I will also mention that when I am working with my teams, I absolutely know when they're not paying attention. And so I call them on it all the time. So everybody's smiling because I think I caught some people coding. <laughs> and it's OK. It's OK. It's fine. Go ahead and code. Um, just uh, code on Project Atomic so that we you know, get some love. <laughs> uh, so do you guys ever have that manager who might have come up to you in the past in your career and, and was like, uh, you know, we have the most important project of all time, and it is the most important thing that we'll ever do, and it must be done by this date? Anybody? Raise your hand. Anybody? Come on. No one? Come on. Seriously. And until we get to that deadline, everybody is going to work weekends. Yeah? Raise hands. Again? No? No one ever had to work weekends? I have. Twice. Maybe more than twice. So I've heard it too. And I've actually, on a frequent basis, although not so much at Red Hat, which is nice, have had to coach people on how to talk to their management about the idea of weekend working. So this is a very, very challenging thing to do, right? So you've got your boss, and they're responsible for your performance. They might be responsible for allocating your bonus. They are responsible for things that are mysterious, like promotion and long-term career goals and all those things that you're kind of like, how did they do that? Um, so it could be quite intimidating to go up to them and say something like, you know what? I am not coming in on a Saturday. How dare you even ask, right? But I will say there is an acceptable way of doing this, and there is an unacceptable way of doing this. There is the acceptable way, which I tend to tell people to do, which is, uh, you know, manager, I have a very active social life. I don't know, make up an excuse. I have a new child. I have an uh, ailing mother. I, whatever you want to say, it could be a complete, like, nonsense. I, I am a very active ballroom dancer, and I have a competition coming up, and my partner is depending on me. Whatever you want to make up, right? And it is very important to me to have that good work-life balance so I understand that we have this commitment to work on this project and we have to be done by the state, but is it, is it perhaps possible that I might be able to work 10 hour days, five days in a row instead of coming in on a Saturday? And you open the communication to remind your boss that you are indeed human. And whether or not you are successful in reminding your boss that you are human is, is a big question mark. But I will say that what it does is it puts the direct emphasis and also responsibility back on your manager um, to remind them, again, that you're human and that empathy is a big part of communication. So the unacceptable way to do this is to just not show up, OK? And, and the reason why I say that is because I guarantee you, you have a team of people who are also going to show up on that Saturday who probably aren't as um, you know, outspoken as you may be, who are not going to say anything to their manager, but who are also going to be like, yeah. um, so if you don't show up and there is no conversation had about why you're not there, they might actually not be okay with that. So it's not just the conversation that you're having with your manager, it's also the coworkers around you who might be perceiving your actions in a way that you really don't want them to. So um, by show of hands, how many of you think I'm an extrovert? Uh, per Outspoken, gregarious, likes to talk to people. I'm not. I'm so far from an expert that sometimes it actually hurts. It actually hurts me to be here. I'm sorry, it does. It actually puts me so outside of my comfort zone that, um, but I will say that that's part of what I do for a living. So <laughs> that's why I'm standing in front of you. And this leads us to soft skill number two, which is collaboration. Um, so you have to work together to get things done, right? Everybody knows that. And in order, in order for you not to make yourself be a bottleneck, essentially, right? So if you're the only person who knows this code, or you're the only person who has, has to push something in production, or you're the only person, you become that self-professed bottleneck so that you basically, you just can't, you can't be that person. You just can't. And it, it's partly because you can't, you cannot be the hero if you want to claim yourself as a DevOps engineer. You have to work well with others, and you have to share the information that you know. Um, so as a DevOps engineer, it is, and, and you can repeat after me, it's no longer OK to say, so-and-so will figure that out. You need to actually, like if somebody says, I have a question, you don't know the answer to that question, you need to actually go out and see if you can help that person answer that question. Or, or maybe 
maybe you don't have to go and find the answer for them, but maybe you give them information or, okay, I don't really know anything about that, but I think this person over here may know something, so go talk to them. Or, you know, I think I saw something in the code base over here, so maybe you want to check over there. But it's not really like, don't even talk to me. That's not really a thing. Um, so going back to the conversation of uh, extroversion, um, I think when, when I was reading about this topic, uh, and, and just in case you guys weren't aware, the software industry has moved to the idea that collaboration is the only way to get your work done. Anybody not aware of that? Because that is the case. Um, in fact, I, I recently was talking to a bunch, I have a very broad network of Agile folks in the Raleigh, North Carolina area that I talk to on a regular basis, and I was asking them questions. And about 75% of all the people who work as Agilist in the Triangle area are doing some method of agile software development. So they're pushing very heavily on the idea that you must work with the people around you. Um, but on the other hand, I also know that the majority of everybody in this room is probably more on, on the introverted side of things. They are more interested in, I love this little pop-up window, which is, this is by the way, not my laptop. So if there's anybody saying anything on that pop-up window, it's not, it's not me. <laughs> or if you can read check and they're saying something crazy. <laughs> it's him right there. <laughs> so in any case, uh, the majority of people are introverts. And when, when I am talking about software collaboration and getting together to uh, you know, talk things through, I'm thinking you're probably thinking that I think this is the way uh, software engineering should work. Um, so, as I was saying earlier, I don't think that collaboration always has to be face-to-face. -face. In fact, I think that that's actually pretty, pretty much not a thing with the majority of engineers that I've worked with in the past. Um, I consider, and I, I frequently tell people that IRC, email, GitHub, checking your code, doing code review, all those things that you guys are doing on a regular basis is a form of collaboration and should be you know, baked more, do it more, have more feedback, do all those things, um, because that allows you to actually work with your, with your coworkers or with your open source community. You don't have to stand around a table with a tie on, laughing, and you know, I think, is that President Obama there in the center? I don't even know. It looks like him, right? In any case, um, <laughs> so you can use those tools like GitHub to communicate with the people around you and get more information or share information that you might have. So one of the things, though, is that even though I am actively pushing extroversion as a method of getting things done, and I also am an introvert myself, these are my tips that I use with my teams to make sure that we don't have introverts table flipping um, at the end of every week because they can't handle it anymore. So I advocate for meetings to be grouped together all in one day. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with Scrum, there are these things called ceremonies in which we have all these meetings that we have to attend and everybody's like, mm. um, So one of the things that I learned very early on in software development is when I thought like I would look at everybody's calendar and I would see, well, they had a meeting in the morning and I'll give them a break for an hour and then I'll schedule something after that. I actually did not know that that was a bad thing to do. I was, th I was thinking I was giving you guys a break and then we'd go back into the meeting. But in reality, what was happening was an hour was like just not enough time to dig into what you were gonna do and to actually get work done. So what I do now is I advocate for four hour blocks of time, or if possible, two days. Two days a week where folks have no meetings at all. And I also tell people that if they're getting invited to meetings where they're not really sure what the agenda is or why they're being invited, they can feel free to decline the meeting as long as if the person follows up and says, why did you decline? I really need you there because of these reasons. You don't ignore them. You actually like interact and say, okay, well maybe I can try to be there. So like I said, advocate for meetings to be grouped together. And this is something that I am empowering you all to do with the folks who are scheduling you for meetings. Advocate at least one or two days where you are meeting free, and that includes that 15-minute stand-up. So if you have one, um, say, can we just do one day a week or two days a week where we're not actually talking to each other? Um, and this allows you to get focused on things, that, uh, you know, focus to get things done. And also, too, by the way, if you are a company where you have some work from home and um, some in the office, the work from home days are a perfect day where you don't have to do any meetings. Yeah, two thumbs up. And then also, and the, and the most important thing, 
Um, if you are from the uh, New England area, like I myself are in the United States, you tend to do something where you're talking faster and faster and faster and faster and faster when you're actually having a conversation with somebody. The biggest thing you can do for introverts and the people who do a lot more thinking in their head than thinking with their mouths is to slow down when you're talking and pause or restate something that somebody has said. So I understand you said this. Is that correct? And so I have, a, I have actually the last team I worked with um, in my IT department had three, I would say, moderately extroverted people and one person who was so introverted that I could barely get him to talk sometimes. And so what would happen um, in this situation is my three extroverts would be like nine miles down the road talking about all these things and there was all these decisions that they made before they had reached that point down the road. And the introvert was standing over here going, I'm still thinking about this decision you made over here. And I, I read like 18 different things and I also looked at the code while you guys were talking and I think maybe this decision was wrong. And so can we talk about it again? And all the decisions that they had made before this decision predicated on the fact that this decision was correct. And so as you can imagine, this created a lot of conflict. So the way that we resolved it as a team is we slowed down. We restated things. We took breaks in meetings so that we could think a little bit more. So do yourself a favor and, and do that for other people in the room. So doing these things can hopefully reduce the pressure on everybody who feels very put out because they're introverts and they're being asked to be extroverts at work. So soft skill number three, the ability to resolve conflict. Um, so let's face it, change is really scary. So I don't know if you guys have ever had to do something where somebody has asked you to not use a tool or not do a thing or look at a different programming language or uh, do agile software development um, and you've never done it before and you're thinking, gosh, do I really want to learn something new? I, I kind of have been doing this for X million years. I, when, when my director said agile software development, like I said, I was really threatened and it was very, very scary for me to um, think about how, how that was going to change what my job was and I would have to learn all those things. So you need to understand that and you also need to understand that people's reactions to that change are going to be extreme. So if you can manage your reaction to their reaction, you'll be better off for it. So um, I was sitting in a room a couple years ago and I'm gonna tell the story really uh, quick. Um, the engineers were arguing about whether they were going to use Puppet or Ansible. Anybody been there? Puppet, Ansible, or Chef? Yeah. And um, they were having a very civil conversation initially, but then a third engineer joined the conversation and it escalated very quickly. And I was sitting over going, um, I don't really know what you guys are talking about right now. I mean, I know, I knew what they were talking about, but I was like, I don't really care what you're talking about. But then they turned to me and said, well, what do you think? And I was like, both tools, like all tools, have pros and cons. And I really, like, what is better for you guys? Like, what do you actually want to use? You are the experts. Please just tell me. And they continued to argue about it, and they continued to demand my opinion. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, I guess I can, you know, pick a name out of a hat, and that's how we'll select the tool that will be everything that we do in IT for the next eight years. Um, but I didn't feel comfortable for that. So I had a, a sitting there and I actually lost my temper with them. I said, oh gosh, could you just, just stop talking about this topic because it, it went on for weeks. It wasn't just like an hour meeting, guys. Um, and so I had this shining moment of realization where I just didn't care anymore. And so why would I say this to a bunch of technical people at a tech conference? And so here is the single most important thing here is know your audience. If you are ranting about a tech thing to a business person or you're ranting about a tech person uh, to somebody like my husband rants about storage stuff all the time and I don't care. Sorry, hon. <laughs> so they were trying to convince me about this and I just, I really, I really did not, I did not care. So the way I de-escalated the situation is I stepped back from them and I said, hey guys, okay, time out let's make a list of all the pros and cons on the whiteboard and I made them do all the pros and cons on the whiteboard and we talked through them. I restated their opinions. I, I tried to interject when the voices started escalating and I did one thing which is another most important tip. When I was restating opinions, I restated them wrong. 
So that might kind of blow your mind, but I just kind of tweaked it a little bit and added something in there that I knew was not quite accurate, but what that did was it got the, the, the brain, I don't know, you guys are like, oh my God, you did that, what do you mean? Um, but what I, what I mean is I said, you know, chef is this and I think it can do this. And they're like, oh, no, 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 let me explain it to you. It actually does this, and this is this, and this is this, and this is this. And what that actually did for everybody in the room is it kind of brought, it brought the like, tension from here down to here, because they, they had to restate calmer so that I would understand. So it is, a, it is a technique that you could choose to employ if you feel comfortable enough about your confidence level about what you know about technology. I really am okay, confidence-wise, to state something wrong, and, and I'm okay with it if somebody thinks I'm dumb because I stated it wrong, because I'm getting what I want out of a conversation. So, by the way, um, does anybody want to know what, what my opinion is now after you know, saying I don't care about Chef Ansible or a puppet at tech conferences? Because I'll tell you, you guys will probably corner me in the hallway and tell me why Chef is better than Ansible, right? So this is now my opinion. Oh, I deleted, no, uh, here, that's my opinion. I still don't care. So let me tell you how you can sway, uh, excuse me, let me tell you how you can actually change people's opinions. So how to convince others that your opinion is right. This is my magic sauce. Stop. So if somebody is arguing with you and you're compelled to argue back with them, the best thing you can do is just stop. That's the age-old count to 100 thing, right? Then listen to what they're saying. And I don't mean a listen. I mean a listen to what they're saying. Ask them questions. Say, OK, I, I heard you say this. Is that what you meant? And give them a chance to restate or re-clarify or add more information to what it is that they're trying to say. And so here is the most important part about asking questions. You may actually get them to think about what it is that they're saying by restating. Like they might say something like, well, I was thinking you could do this, this. Oh, wait a minute. I think I'm actually going to get stuck here. So maybe we need to do it this way. And they may actually talk themselves into what you were going to argue with them about to begin with by just letting them restate it out loud a second time. You know, slow down let them think it through. Sometimes people talk with their mouths and they're thinking with their mouths. And then two, by listening to their answers, maybe they'll have the ability to change the way that you're perceiving the technology to be. So like I said, ask questions and really listen. And then finally, compromise. So you cannot have things your way all the time. And you must learn to choose when you, your battles are to be fought versus when they're not to be fought. So you must learn to compromise. And you also need to know when to let go. So my girlfriend wanted a cat, but I didn't want a cat, so we compromised and we got a cat. Yeah. So you're not going to be able to you know, change everybody's mind all the time, and you basically need to be OK with that. Um, and please don't argue until you are mortal enemies, because that is not going to help you out at all. And this is my final point of wisdom. You don't need to attend every argument that you're invited to. I frequently get inflammatory emails all the time from people, or hallway conversations, or IRC, like, this is not, this is stupid, we're not gonna do that. I choose not to answer a lot of it, because to me, answering it incites the ability, or incites the, opens the debate. And just by not saying anything doesn't mean that I actually agree with that person, it just means that I haven't answered yet. So if you've ever gotten that thing where you've sent an email and about like a month later they've responded to you with the information that you're waiting for, I view that as a method of conflict resolution because eventually that person will either, they, they either really need to have me know their opinion so they'll find me and they'll probably want to have a face-to-face -face conversation with me, which I think is so much better than email, or they'll call me on the phone or whatever. But if they really, really passionate about what they're saying and they really want to change my mind, they will follow up. So I, I wait for them to come to me. So if you are ever in a situation where you are sitting down to write a very inflammatory IRC message or I'm going to tell somebody, you know, you suck because your code sucks and all this stuff, what, what I am going to tell you is that it is, it is not okay to do that. 
the best thing that you have in your arsenal of tools as engineers is the ability to disconnect from your keyboard and the, the ability to step away from what it is that you are in the moment doing. So just disconnect, take a break, go get coffee, go get water, whatever, and then come back and then respond. Or wait, wait a night. Waiting a night typically works for me. Or I write the email I want to write, and then I step away from my computer, and then a couple of hours later I come back and I go, oh my god, if I sent that, I'd be a real jerk. So that's another tip. So as long as you commit to trying to practice all these ideas, I think that you could, as an individual, get to where you need to be in terms of communication. So here's homework. So these are the things you need to practice. Expressing your opinions concisely and calmly. Pay attention to body language. Collaboration doesn't always have to be face to face, so use all the tools in your arsenal. You don't have to be right every time, and most importantly, don't attend every argument that you're invited to. So this is the point in the man pages where we show examples. So I'm going to encourage you all to tell me a situation that you have experienced in the past where you have been in a bad situation and you probably have not responded well. And we'll talk about what you could have done better. Is there anybody? And I am handing out these glorious Define the Future 2016 DevConf scarves as, and, and I, for those of you who came in late, they're very warm. Yeah, we're going to pass the mic to the one guy or one brave enough to share. Anybody? So hi, uh, hi. I'm the DevOps engineer. So, and I don't uh, have the situation you wanted to me, but I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, I was in a situation not, a long, uh, not a long ago that I had to point some uh, design flaws in some application. And uh, I had to uh, tell it to the architect. So I told him that there are some flaws and so on. They were like quite fatal flaws, uh, flaws so the application would do some bad things. So, and he was like, okay, whatever. So he, I gathered some evidence and then came uh, another time uh, to him and so on and showed him that yes, this is a big problem. He was like, okay, we have to change it and so on. I had the solution already, whatever. But from that point on, he just doesn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> How can I handle this? Because then it's, he told my manager that I have bad soft skills and stuff and so on. So now I, I, and I was calm when I told him that there was flaws and so on, but he doesn't like me now. So uh, right now the situation between uh, me and him is like quite not very good. So. Yeah, I understand that. I, I actually had a similar situation when I was much younger. Um, one of the managers that I indirectly reported to uh, wasn't okay with, and, and factually it was uh, very related to the proposal that I had written that I referred to earlier, wasn't really okay with the idea that I was trying to change things. And it caused a, a situation in which I had to actually like go to lunch with HR and the manager and have a how can we resolve this conflict meeting. Anybody? Anybody have this situation? Yeah. Yeah, right? So I would say that if it ever escalates to that point, it's going to be it's going to be really hard to recover from that um, socially, uh, just because you have a lot of like negative feelings built up. Um, I will also say something that my husband told me, like I think I was like maybe 20. Um, you really will never be able to change somebody else. You can only change how you yourself react to what somebody's doing. So while while I would love to tell you all the ways to get this person to be your friend again, the reality is is that. I mean, like you can take them out for a beer, you can take them out, you know, you can do all these different things and I would, I would advocate that you try, right? I wouldn't give up, um, but I, I don't, I think the only thing I can tell you is to make your life better is to think about how you're responding to the way that he treats you and try to, try to not take it so personally. You probably hurt his feelings because he didn't think of it, right? And, and so, and, and that's not necessarily, I mean, I, I, I'm also not telling you not to tell people when you found something that's technically wrong. That's not it at all. In fact, you need to be able to be okay with that. But if, if the guy you're referring to was sitting here saying, well, I had this engineer tell me like something was wrong, I would say, again, 
you really have to figure out how you're going to respond when people come to you with these things and d decide how you're, you yourself are going to react to it. Um, I, I just I don't know what to tell you other than that. Yeah. Yeah, and we are unfortunately we're out of time. Oh no. So yeah. I'm so sorry. I, 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 I'm I talk too sorry much. too. So <laughs> thank you, Jen, for thank your you. talk. Thank you. Thank you. Come ask me questions in the hallway and I'll pass these out. <laughs>